Good afternoon. All right, that's better. My name is John Sutherland. I am the Fazenfeld family head of environmental and ecological engineering, we say triple E, at Purdue University. I'd like to thank all of you for joining us for this AWESP Distinguished Lecturer Conference. I now have the honor of introducing our distinguished lecturer, the highlight of the event. Uh, and that speaker is Diane M. McKnight. Uh, she is a professor in the Department of Civil, Environmental, and Architectural Engineering, a member of the Environmental Engineering Program faculty, and a fellow of the Institute of Arctic and Alpine Research at the University of Colorado. Diane's research focuses on the coupling of hydrology and water quality in streams and lakes, and the consequences for aquatic ecosystems and water supplies. She began her career as a research hydrologist with the U.S. Geological Survey, where she studied the biogeochemistry of lakes in the blast zone of Mount St. Helens and acid mine drainage streams in pristine alpine lakes in the Rocky Mountains. She has done many, many other things, including conducting research on stream ecosystems as part of the McMurdo Dry Valley's Long-Term Ecological Research Project. They abbreviate that as MCM-LTER project in Antarctica. She has been president of the American Society of Limnology and Oceanography and editor of the Journal of Geophysical Research Biogeosciences. Interestingly, she served as the chair of editorial committee for the LTER Schoolyard Children's Book Series and authored the second book of the series. Very, very interesting. Uh, Dr. McKnight is a fellow of the American Geophysical Union, a member of the National Academy of Engineering, and received the John Dalton Award from the European Geophysical Union in 2015. Let's all welcome Professor Diane McKnight. Well, uh, thank you very much for that uh, introduction, and I want to say how much I've enjoyed being here at Purdue University in uh, Lafayette, Indiana. There's a Lafayette, Colorado, right near Boulder, Colorado, just so you, I wanted to share that. And um, this work that I've been talking about is work that I've conducted with my colleagues at the USGS, colleagues at the University of Colorado, and many uh, graduate and undergraduate students. So we'll start off with this uh, pristine Colorado mountain landscape, but we're going to be talking about events that happened here and their legacy about a hundred years ago. There was the mining boom in, which began in the 1860s and persisted to the 1930s, the gold rush, which brought the European settlers and people from the East Coast to Colorado. This is what the Pennsylvania mine looked like in uh, 1890, and here's the remains of this structure today. Um, these abandoned mines are located in remote areas at high elevation, no power, no roads, and uh, not listed here, we have significant avalanche danger in the winter. So, uh, this map here highlights in red the major river systems that are impacted by uh, mine, by metals from mine drainage from this legacy. We put this map together in 1981 when we were thinking this is going to be cleaned up now during my uh, career as a hydrologist. And uh, this map pretty much represents the situation right now. But we are, there's more action now towards dealing with these challenges. And as I said, the setting itself is part of the challenge. So what is acid rock drainage? It's the chemical weathering of rocks where we have this mineral ore, pyrite, uh, which is present both in a disseminated throughout the country rock in the Colorado mineral belt, but also as uh, veins of ore, reacts 
with oxygen and water, and we have the products of sulfuric acid and other metals, such as copper and zinc, and this eventually changes the stream chemistry. The water can essentially turn um, orange because of the precipitation of iron oxides, and as we have as represented here, the fish aren't that happy. So that's sort of an overview. As environmental engineers and scientists, we can think of this also as a series of chemical reactions where the pyrite shown there reacts with oxygen and water, and we get ferrous iron and then sulfuric acid and protons. The next step is this ferrous iron again reacts with oxygen to produce ferric iron, and then that ferric iron can be hydrolyzed to fer ferric hydroxides that precipitate, and then um, the ferric iron can also react with the pyrite itself, creating a propagation step where we have a rate of reaction that is actually controlled by the extent to which the oxidation of ferrous iron reaction two is conducted or carried out by a chemoautotrophic process driven by a bacteria thiobacillus ferrioxidans because as the pH drops due to the generation of uh, sulfate, the abiotic rate of reaction two slows down to essentially be minuscule. So we're dependent on this thiobacillus to carry this reaction forward. So another perspective, again, in terms of the ecosystem and water quality impacts, we have this low pH, uh, pH 4 and less, uh, high metals solubility under these low pH, and then uh, that enhances metal uptake by biota. In zones where, say, an acid rock drainage stream joins a pristine stream that has neutral pH, then these iron oxides that are represented here can uh, precipitate and coat the stream bed and limit, constrain the growth of uh, benthic invertebrates. And there's particular species of algae that can survive in this environment. So uh, acid mine drainage, back when, again, when I came to Colorado, it was clearly one of the greatest water quality problems in the West. Here's a picture of a alpine stream contaminated with mine drainage. I uh, like to point out, if you go to the Denver airport, colorful Colorado calendars may have a picture of a colorful orange stream. Uh, check it out if you're ever going through DIA. But if we, stepping aside, if we think about the um, West and we have the challenge of climate change impacts on the mountain states, they're basically loser states in this context in the same way that uh, low elevation coastal environments are loser states because our environment is changing pr particularly rapidly and we have a, a challenge of water availability. So what's shown here is Superfund. Those are that, that's kind of highlighted. And it would be 33 to $70 billion to clean up this legacy because the gold rush wasn't just in Colorado, it was in California and then Montana and then Idaho. And we're not even putting Alaska and the Yukon on this map. So uh, what is Colorado in general trying to do to adjust to this loser state status. Well, clearly, the ski industry is a big driver in terms of tourism. And uh, one potential adaptation, which we can't really implement, is moving the winter holiday till the end of January instead of the end of December. That would help us out a lot in the future, but we can't do that. And so the ski areas have this problem of what's called uh, snow rot and the need for snow at the lower basins. But if we make snow with water that the ski industry may be entitled to through their water rights and it's contaminated with acid mine drainage, what happens to those metals? It just gets spread out 
all over their watersheds and becomes another water quality problem for them. So uh, that's one issue. Another issue is that how do you counteract this challenge of the um, shrinking ski season was potentially by enhancing the four season resort approach and you'll see a lot of that on the posters through Denver airport. Well, uh, are there trout in these streams to go fishing? No. So that's seen again as an impediment. So in almost setting the target for any kind of cleanup to have a good outcome. And another issue is the aesthetic issue of wilderness and backpacking. Um, uh, there are 7,000 miles of acid mine drainage impacted streams once you go up to the headwaters where in terms of camping and recreation. So it's pretty pervasive in terms of uh, recognizing that there's something wrong. Uh, another reason that this is still a challenge is that the state, Colorado, doesn't get to change the Clean Water Act. The uh, mines are regulated as point sources, such that um, any, from a regulatory perspective, any entity that takes on a cleanup effort assumes liability for this problem in perpetuity. That's a kind of a disincentive, especially given the fact that the pyrite weathering is a continuing process. It occurs because the mine workings and then the tailings, they're all being exposed to oxygen and this chemical process that I showed you is progressing at this rapid rate. And here is an abandoned uh, liming facility next to that abandoned mine that I showed you early on. Uh, I mentioned the uh, other difficulty is there's no principal responsible party. These miners are long gone. And then if we're trying to go to this Four Season Resort approach, the Superfund designation as a destination uh, vacation destination doesn't really have the right vibe, maybe. So that's something that's been uh, considered. And then many potential approaches that might work in the Midwest are impeded by our hydrograph, where the snow is surely going to melt. And so something like a constructed wetland might just be flushed quickly during that snowmelt period. And we sort of know this from uh, just looking at some natural wetlands. So here we are looking at the Dinero tunnel tailings pile. During snowmelt, these tailings just leach a slug of zinc and everything else. And then there's this wetland at the base. And if you were to walk around on this, you'll be hip deep in iron oxide muck. So even in summer, it doesn't do much in terms of retaining the metals that were coming out from the adit. So bulkheading is currently one of the approaches that is being implemented. And basically what this involves is uh, stopping the groundwater from just running through and being exposed to oxygen, but actually backing up the tunnels and hopefully creating anoxic conditions that would suppress that cascade of chemical reactions and uh, limit the... Uh, Problem. So in many of these watersheds, there wasn't just one mine. So these bulkheads are going in here, and then the next mine here, the next year, or three years later over there. So as we can think about this mountain, we're sort of plugging up the holes, and what's been happening is now there's new seeps coming out, and some of them are pristine water, and some of them are this acidic, metal-enriched water as we plug all the leaky pipes in this mountain. And then there's been some failures where the bulkhead fails, and suddenly then you have a really big problem for that moment. So, uh, so I think I'm convincing you that this is a challenge for us. What I wanted to talk about in the context of Trouble Ahead is that this problem of 
acid mine drainage is superimposed on the natural weathering of pyrite, which is under the broader term acid rock drainage. And I've been studying this river system, the Snake River right here, uh, the Upper Snake. It drains an area that's naturally acidic due to disseminated pyrite in the watershed. Deer Creek is a somewhat pristine stream. And this Snake River goes to Silverthorne. And down here is the, um, the Dillon Reservoir, which is the water supply for all of Denver. Many reservoirs come in and feed this system. And this uh, scale here shows that the red streams are pH 4 and less. The blue are, have a pH above 6, and the orange is in between. So that's there's a lot of orange and red streams, if you're following me. So um, in the long-term ecological research program that I'm involved in, we have a very careful monitoring program of water quality every year. Um, our research in acid mine drainage was never as well funded, so we have samples from here and there and EPA and USGS. But here is a plot of the summer, sort of late July, August, September, concentrations of zinc and uh, sulfate. Actually, these are just September data where the sulfate is in uh, green, going from uh, about 40 up to uh, 160 uh, ppm. And the zinc is gone from about 400 ppb to 1,600. The threshold for the brown trout and the brook trout in terms of being able to survive was crossed around 600. So this stream has gone from fish to no fish. And this is at this headwater stream of the upper snake that I mentioned. So what's going on? And we saw right here there was an acceleration. Well, here's a closer look at this confluence. So the upper snake is to um, your left. And you can see how the stream bed is orange. And the pristine stream is coming in to your right. And that's Deer Creek, and we can see right in the confluence where the iron and aluminum oxides precipitate. Uh, the, in terms of pH, when I first collected a water sample right above that confluence in the upper snake, the pH was about 4.2 in the summer, late summer, and now it's 2.7. So this is not, this is a lot of water, and uh, so that's a big change. I think I'll skip this. This is putting this in the context of where the pen mine is. I'll skip this as well. Some, at first we thought, well, maybe, maybe the flow is actually lower in the summer than it used to be. Maybe uh, the things are drying up. Here's a plot of zinc concentration on the y-axis and flow on the x-axis where we have the points where the blues are from the 1970s and 2011 is in the red. And you can see it's not about the flow. It's not less dilution. And here's the opposite for pH, how the pH has gone down. So what we think is happening is during this period in the summer. And here's a hydrograph showing how during the winter, when there's snow melt, the sulfate is diluted. But then um, during, I'm sort of see where that peak is, so how that high sulfate concentrations have gone up during the summer after snow melt. So what's going on? Is this a watershed process? More likely than an in-stream process, uh, but then how is that potentially being modified by the hyperreic zone? How many of you have heard of a hyperreic zone? A few. OK, let me explain this. So this is the zone under and adjacent to the stream that you see, where water is continually moving in and out of those sediments. And so that movement can be represented from an engineering point of view as a transient storage. But it's very important in controlling the chemistry of most streams, especially for nutrient 
and it's such as nitrogen and phosphorus, but also for metals, because that, for metals that might absorb or desorb from sediments, that's where those reactions can happen. Uh, so one of our hypotheses in terms of the um, driver is that we've generating a new weathering front because the summer temperatures are warmer and summer is actually starting sooner. The timing of snowmelt in the Rocky Mountains in general has moved forward two to four weeks depending on uh, uh, where you are in the Rocky Mountains. So we used to say we have only two seasons in the Rocky Mountains. We have winter and road construction. So, because uh, that's what happens in summer. So our road construction season has gotten longer. And for those of you here in the Midwest, this corresponds to uh, the similar trend where the duration of lake ice cover has decreased two to four weeks. So I, for my people who are climate change skeptics, I like to explain that, well, you know about Lake Wobegon? The ice fishing season is a month shorter than it used to be. Maybe you guys are too young to know about <laughs> Lake Wobegon. Anyway, uh, so one of the things we wanted to do was track down exactly where in this upper watershed these increasing metals were coming from. So we did what limnologists do. We went upstream and started sampling the individual tributaries. And here's the zinc concentration as we go upstream. And the red circle there indicates what we call the tributaries of interest. And these zinc concentrations were 15,000 ppb. It was really high concentrations. And uh, we uh, had these samples analyzed. And in addition to analyzing for the major metals, the analyst at the University of Colorado was doing a run for rare earth elements and called us up and said, where are these samples from? Because we had uh, 40 ppb neodymium. With, and I'll be coming back to that. But right now, let's just focus on the zinc. And how do we understand what's going on in terms of these hyperreic zone interactions? We can do an experiment that's not that different from the kind of column experiment you might do in the lab. But we can do this at the stream scale. And what we do is we inject a tracer, in this case, sodium chloride, something that won't react with the sediments, and then see how the concentration changes downstream. If there's an inflow, that will dilute the pulse. So that's a way to quantify how much water is coming in. And then the storage in the hyperreic zone can create a progressive lag in how that pulse shows up, and then also result in the tracer bleeding out after you shut off the injection. So what I'm going to do now uh, is switch to a little movie that was made, and it wasn't quite so recent. So we can turn this on now. Uh, the sound is from uh, Colorado Public the Radio its way uh, through Summit County. broadcaster it who came with, the with us River and to the field. eventually runs into Dillon Reservoir. At first glance, the creek seems healthy, but not to the eyes of University of Colorado professor Diane McKnight, who's been studying the region. engineering research with research sound. Experiments I said, like I have stream sound for you, Jeff for Wong sure. Are setting up next to Peru Creek this uh, summer. Or would you rather just have three pumps? They're trying to understand how the creek transports metals from the mine throughout the waterway and into the ecosystem. Wong plans to inject a tracer, in this case sodium chloride or common table salt, into the creek to mimic the metal oxides. But I'm using a conservative tracer because these metals won't interact with what's in the stream already, so I get a really good sense of how long it takes for the sodium chloride to be at each site. Um, and using that data um, through a computer modeling program, uh, I'll be able to characterize other metals. Wong gets ready to put a clear plastic hose into a footlocker-sized tank of salt solution that he mixed that morning with a kayak paddle. 
The hose is connected to a small pump. Another clear tube runs from the pump down to Peru Creek. Alright, and we're off. A steady trickle drips out of the tube and into the creek. So you see it's the tube? It's carried downstream, passing different monitoring sites where Wong's so 13 like assistants for party. the day you know, people camp ahead of time, bottles. and so in one of these experiments, we uh, can so collect 1,200 water samples because we're collecting the rising the limb and the falling limb at different sites, but it provides information are, that you can use to then quantify these rates of reactions. So if we can go back to the slides now, thank you very much. So to understand what was going on in this tributary of interest, um, we organized the field trip for the fall um, applied stream ecology class that I teach in order to have the students collect samples. Well, half of the students were collecting samples while the other half were learning about benthic invertebrates and other ways. So that's how we were able to have so many of these sites in order to understand where were the metals coming from in this tributary. Uh, and here's the kind of data that we generate where the blue is that site closest to where we did the injection up in the Talus highest elevation site. And then the orange is the site furthest down. So you see there's uh, arrival is delayed. As we go downstream, the pulse is attenuated due to this hyperreic interaction. Can you guys see that? What's going on up at the top? Why isn't this flat? Is that because the flow is increasing during the middle of the day because there is melting still of some permafrost, so that causes the plateau concentration to not be quite flat. And we can see between this site at close to 800 meters and 891 meters, there is a big drop in the plateau concentration, which indicates that there's probably upwelling of groundwater in this wetland kind of environment right at the base of the stream. Uh, here's, we can use those data to calculate discharge by considering the dilution. We have to keep track of how fast the pump is pumping and this chloride concentration. But you can see there's a big increase in discharge in terms of liters per minute. And the zinc concentration drops but if we consider load, the zinc concentration is actually going up, or the zinc load is going up. And we thought, well, why is that happening? Because we think of these wetland sediments as absorbing metals, but then we realize this is pH 2 water coming into these wetland sediments. And so it's probable that that low pH is just desorbing metals that have been absorbed in the past. So, Again, I don't want to go into it in too much detail of how we can use this model that was referred to in our little movie, but we can characterize effectively this cross-sectional area of the hyperreic zone in terms of how much area is interacting with the stream and the exchange coefficient, how fast with in order to simulate our data. And what I want to point out is in this very last reach, we have a high lateral inflow. The hyperreic zone effective area in meters squared has increased three or four times because that means a lot is interacting. And this exchange coefficient has gone up an order of magnitude. So that's what we need to know to understand these transitions in this environment. So we can say this last reach is where hyperreic exchange is mattering. There may be some interest stream photochemistry that is actually controlling the form of the ferric iron in solution, but most of the source is in this upper part. And uh, this is what it looks like up there. There's, we are quite sure, everybody wants to know, are you sure there wasn't really a secret abandoned mine? It's just a talus field. So this is where this is all drying out and uh, the source. And there's many areas in the mineralized zone uh, in Colorado that are like that. So we've been trying to do uh, data mining, as I explained, to get at this. Are there other places where um, 
the maybe an increase in background. And it's very difficult because as I explained in the last five or six years when there's been more activity with this bulkheading, we don't have as many places where there's data being collected where things haven't changed. That's what's just represented here. So getting back to these rare earth elements. Uh, rare earths, as you know, are needed for uh, our modern technology, my cell phone, and well, I'm sure you all have newer cell phones than I do, but it, it's really needed for all these electronics. There's a limited source, and uh, there's a lot we don't know. So um, we can ask this question, have the rare earth elevated concentrations always been there? What's the dominant source? And then is there some fractionation downstream? As I mentioned, this water goes into Dillon Reservoir, which is a water supply. I mentioned that our monitoring was a bit hit or miss, but as you saw, that was a pretty substantial trend. Uh, we hypothesized that um, we would maybe be able to get some information by looking at the water samples that I brought with me when I joined the University of Colorado after working at the USGS for 17 years because I just couldn't bear to throw out all my boxes of samples. That's what you see in the back. So uh, we did a, a literal data mining where we went and found which uh, samples might be relevant in terms of this time period that we could use to get some additional analyses done. And uh, what we have here is the flow at the Keystone Gauge, which is uh, right before the river goes into Dillon Reservoir. And here are the neodymium concentrations and uh, some of those samples at the site above the confluence at, uh, in 1995 and 96, where we're looking at one or two PPBA, where now the concentrations in 2013 are nine or 10. So that's an order of magnitude increase. And similarly for the site directly downstream after the Deer Creek comes in. So here's what our plot looks like if we look at zinc and PPB in the black and these neodymium numbers, there's clearly been an increase in this. And we went and also looked at these rare earth elements throughout this watershed, and we saw some pretty high concentrations, again, in the order of um, five or six, fairly far downstream. And just to give you a sense of how high these are, we have these dash lines are samples. So the Penn Mine is the, the outlet of the Penn Mine is the red dash line. The Ohio River is the orange, and these are, this is a log scale. So these concentrations are four or five orders of magnitude above natural background in river systems. And uh, I'm going to skip this. So, um, you know, that's one reason we really don't know that much about the biogeochemistry of those rare earth elements and whether they might be an issue for drinking water. Uh, because the, the concentrations are typically so low. And we can use uh, knowledge about the relative, let me go back here, um, about what's going on in terms of the relative proportions of the rare earth elements to get a sense of what some of the dominant geochemical processes might be in terms of how these different rare earths would absorb onto iron and aluminum oxides, for example. Um, and that's what's shown here. This europium can decrease relative to other rare earth elements as an indication of reactive, non-conservative processes. Uh, so we did a study of the rare earth distribution going from this tributary 2095 the dash blue line at the top, and you see this fairly arced relationship of these rare earth elements down on the x-axis, all the way down to the keystone gauge. So just all you need to see is this sort of arced line and this big dip. 
at the bottom on the way down, which is telling us there's biogeochemistry happening in the stream. The other thing to note is we have about, this is um, up around 10 ppb, and by here we get to um, 1 ppb, or some low value, but it's not non-detectable. We're not getting to the low values of the Mississippi River and such, of the Ohio River. And so um, we know that something must be actually keeping this, some of these rare earths in solution. So here's uh, another study that we did where we looked at how the rare earths were partitioned among the dissolved phase, the particulate phase, and the colloidal phase. So that's what's represented in this graph. So let me take you through, and this is again going downstream from the snake on the left to the place near the keystone gauge. So at the snake upstream, the yttrium, and the neodymium, it's all green. It's all dissolved. If we go downstream, it's less dissolved and then partitioned between the colloidal and the particulate phase. But maybe there's some interaction between these colloids and uh, the dissolved phase, such as potentially driven by photochemistry, that's keeping it moving and not being removed through hyperreic exchange or some other mechanism that one might hope for if these were highly sorbable. So we find that the largest percent is dissolved below pH 5, and that if there's aluminum oxides present at the pH above 6, that's when it's in the colloidal phase, and it's also generally present in the colloidal form or particulate at neutral pH. So, as I said, very little is available in the literature about toxicity to daphnia or how we set water quality standards. There's no water quality standards. How can we get a sense about whether we should be worried about this? Because if these rare earths are absorbed on iron oxides and they're going into Dillon Reservoir, and then we can, can sample the plume of the Snake River going out to the reservoir, those oxides are going to settle then in the winter, the reservoir is ice covered, the bottom waters go anoxic. Whatever is absorbed onto those iron oxides have the potential to desorb under reducing conditions. People are nodding their heads, so you, you know that that's how the iron cycling works. So they, we don't know what the profile of rare earth elements looks like in Dillon Reservoir in winter. You know, that, I'll have to, have to write a proposal to find out, but we can look at the concentrations of these rare earth elements in the biota. And that's what we did here in a study where we have our sampling sites grouped by, here's the pristine stream, Deer Creek, the upper snake, we have three sites in the upper snake, the lower snake, and then Peru Creek, that mine I showed you. And we look at manganese, it's in the 900 micro grams per gram, There's, that's not that surprising, and the sediments in Deer Creek are enriched in manganese. We look at lead, also they're in the 10 to 30 micrograms per gram. Nickel is in the 2 to 10 micrograms per gram, and it's pretty high in the lower snake. And these are all this same invertebrate, Zapata hazi which is common throughout Colorado in these uh, acid mine drainage and acid rock drainage streams. I mentioned the fish don't do very well, but Zapata hazi is handling all of this over this period of time. This is a big mayfly. Well, it's, you know, if you're not used to looking at mayflies or whatever, but it's, it's fairly substantial and it's a sh shredder. It eats leaves that are fallen into the stream, but it, the shredders are vulnerable. They take up the uh, bacterial uh, biofilms that are on the leaf material, and that's where they get their nutrition. So if we look at the rare earth elements, here's neodymium. It's in this range of two to eight micrograms per gram, comparable to nickel, cadmium, and copper. So that tells us that these 
rare earths, at least for these biota, can be assimilated. And uh, here's gal gadolinium, prazodinium. These are compounds we haven't been thinking about. They're in pretty low concentrations. Um, what's going on? Are these rare, rare earth elements being detoxified by a compounds called metallothionines that this particular invertebrate most certainly has. That's how this invertebrate detoxifies um, these metals. So it's a family of cysteine-rich, low molecular weight proteins, and maybe that's what's going on. But that doesn't mean that we would have a high tolerance, humans would necessarily have a high tolerance for these kinds of metals. So uh, here's a little cartoon representing this potential pathway um, for REE uptake. Again, taken up by the algae. I mentioned the flux from the sediments. Uh, and just to sum up in order to have time for questions, I want to put this in the larger context. In many of your talks, there's been this idea of what's the economic opportunities, the economic constraints. We um, know that these rare earth elements have value. We, you know, the modern era needs these rare earth elements. We are struggling with potentially the challenge of the background changing while we're also trying to mitigate this legacy problem, and yet we don't have funds necessary to do this. So is there a way to creatively put these different considerations together and develop the technology that would allow us to do this? And our current approaches, say through Superfund, aren't really designed to drive this kind of uh, uh, exploratory technology. And I think about how things might change, it's still going to be a long time before the avalanche danger in early February goes away, so that we may be needing to think about robotics and high tech and telemetry, because if we're going to do anything that makes a difference or that is economic, makes a difference from an ecosystem point of view or is economically viable, we'll need to do it year round in these challenging environments where we'd like to uh, get that neodymium right there at tributary uh, 1085 rather than trying to take it out of the drinking water coming out of Dillon Reservoir because that'll be harder for sure. So uh, I'd like to uh, yeah go back and stop there and I'll be glad to take any questions. So uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, we have microphones down here uh, on the right side, left side, stage right, stage left. Uh, please come down and we'll get some of these questions. Somebody has to go first. Um. All right, we're going to call on people then. <laughs> okay. So I, I was going to say, how many people here, I saw some posters that had to do with thinking about rare earth elements. How many of you have been thinking about those challenges? There are, there are a few. Yes. Um, what do you think? Is this an impossible idea? That's my question for you. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. You know what I was thinking? Uh, I, I spent some time as a young person, and my parents would have an occasional beer. Mm -hmm. And the uh, motto for Coors was always, it's the water. Yeah. So I, now I'm a little scared about <laughs> Coors beer. Well, actually, that's a good, I, good point, because Coors is, gets its water. Um, downstream from another mining district, uh, the Blackhawk, Central City, uh, 
all of that. And um, I mentioned that I teach a graduate course in applied stream ecology, and uh, several of my students have done field team projects in that area, and I, I tell them, don't go past any signs that say, do not enter, don't get arrested. I'd really be great if you don't get arrested. And then I've had a few presentations over the year that slide three is the <laughs> barbed wire fence or whatever that they went around to get a sample near Coors Brewery. So, but they've never sampled it for rare earth elements going no, into no. <laughs> Okay. Yeah. Um, yes. Well, thank you very much, and I, I'd like to point out that the flow rate in this one tributary is really just a trickle. You know, it's not a lot of a lot of water. So that, and there's, if you can pull anything out and then put the water that you're done with back in the stream, then you're, there's an advantage. Yeah. That's a correct, and by looking at the relative concentrations near the source, you can get a sense of the, the, the geologic age of different deposits and how they may have, when they may have formed. I'm not an expert in that. So, um, for example, the relative distribution of rare earth elements near the Penn mine is different from that near the other source. So, yeah, that's going to be telling us something. Uh, you know, I guess another point is, uh, should we mine these sites? Is that what you were getting at? Just um, there, you know, this, this, is, uh, this location is very close to I-70 that cuts across the state of Colorado. So it's not that far. I don't know. And then there would be a principal responsible party that would be responsible for cleaning this up when they were all done and we're not using the neodymium for whatever, you know, so sometime in the future. I have a question. Um, you talked about macro invertebrate and some, a part of ecological in, <laughs> implications. Has anyone ever thought of looking at micro invertebrates? Because thinking about like the larvae formation and then to the to grown up microinvertebrates. Yeah, so that's a good question. Um, as I mentioned, the two groups of uh, types of invertebrates that we think of being in streams that are mountain streams that are indicative of um, uh, healthy streams are 
the, the stone flies, which are typically shredders. So they're shredding leaves and living off that biomass, but also the biofilm on the leaf. The other group are mayflies, if any of you have been fishing. So the mayflies are grazers that are eating the algae that are growing on the rocks. And there's not as much in the way of algal growth on the rocks in an acid mine drainage stream, but we never find any mayflies in these acid rock drainage or acid mine drainage um, streams. So it could be that the algae that are growing are just concentrating these, the metal too much in order that they can't be detoxified by the invertebrates, so that there's an ecosystem cascade. Um, but uh, yeah, I think there's ch questions having to do with those different pathways, and the microorganisms are very important. So I know that you said that this problem has been evident for quite some time. Have, has your findings influenced current mining operations at all? Uh, that's a good question. I, current mining operations are not very prevalent in this region in Colorado. Uh, there are almost hobbyist people who have inherited a mine claim and go up on the weekends and hike around and prospect a little bit, but they're not really active mines. Uh, the, some of the larger mines, such as the molybdenum mine near Leadville, is essentially um, not formally closed down because that would be very expensive for the company. They'd need to do extensive remediation, but is at this low level of activity um, in case molybdenum becomes highly valuable and not as avail available as it is now. So um, it's largely um, abandoned mines in Colorado and Arizona, northern Arizona, there's some large economically active uh, mines. In terms of the air pollution connection, for active mines, there's an issue for air pollution in the context of the Dillon Reservoir, the sediments from the streams have been deposited along the shore of Dillon Reservoir, and when the water level drops below those deposits, then there's concern about wind mobilizing the dry sediments and creating um, air quality issues in that region, which we have strong winds, it's hard to imagine, but these are parallel to some problems that have happened in other regions. Yeah, good question. Go ahead. Um, thanks for your talk. Um, I'm actually asking a question, maybe your past research rather than what you're looking into sure. in the future with the rare earth elements. But um, so you mentioned that some of the remediation options that we might use here in the Midwest, like wetlands or bioreactors, might not be viable over in Colorado in the West. Um, so I was just curious if you had ideas of things that have been successful and if they have. Um, long-term viability or if they also are going to fail with uh, the changing climate? Well, as I said, so far what has been tried are bulkheads. There are a few places that actually generate the sludge by raising the pH and essentially process that sludge as ore. But that's not taking off uh, very much because of the high cost of daily operations and the difficulty in terms of unit operations of recovering that. So there's a few places in um, Silverton and in um, Breckenridge where that's going on, but it's very difficult. And the f higher up in elevation you get to the Penn Mine, uh, that would be 
very difficult because just having a facility at that spot would not be something you could do year round. So um, we, that's one reason we're at a standstill is there's not a good low cost approach. Before anyone else, I wanted to, because uh, we're, we're slowly losing everybody. Everyone. We have a little gift for Dr. McKnight. So. Uh, um, oh, thank you. No, it's, it's, it's a little hefty, so. Oh yeah, but uh, <laughs> I, um, I brought my suitcase. Oh, that's, that's good. That's great, good, thank good. you very much. All right. I really appreciate it. Sure, thank this, you. It's thank great, you. great. This is wonderful. Yes, yes. All right, you know, I know that many of you have other commitments, but uh, if you need to leave, uh, thank you for coming to the AWESP Distinguished Lecturer Conference. Um, and uh, if you need to leave, please leave quietly. We, have, we did have one more question. Yep. You guys have been a great audience. I really appreciate it. Thank you very much. This is great, John. Yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, I didn't quite catch that. So if we have to neutralize the acid from the mine drainage. Yes. So we have one of there's you have to do that very carefully that if you just mix lime with the the um, acid mine drainage, what happens is the lime becomes coated with iron oxides and then it stops dissolving. So you have to have some kind of operation to keep the lime very colloidal and the surface from becoming coated. And so one way to, in, sometimes they try to do that by having an anoxic environment so the ferrous iron doesn't oxidize to ferric iron in the presence of lime. So it's pretty tricky. Um, one group uh, tried to set up a facility where to keep the uh, water anoxic by adding uh, hay and straw to have it very anoxic to gen because of the carbon, but then there are a lot of nutrients leaching out of the straw that then create an algal bloom downstream, and they had a whole bunch of trouble. So there are path, there are ways to try to get that to work, but it's pretty tricky. Okay, there are maybe fenton reagent also involved in the because low pH, lot of iron fenton reagent maybe participate in the iron cycle as well. Yes, in the, in the photochemistry of this iron, these iron-rich streams, photofenton reactions are very important where the production of uh, hydrogen peroxide by photolysis of the dissolved organic matter uh, drives uh, the oxidation of ferrous iron to ferric iron and enhances the rate of precipitation. Yes, so. Again, th thank you very much. Yeah.